And this month, uh, our emphasis has been the bus ministry. Uh, there is, I believe, still no better evangelistic tool uh, that is available to the local church than the bus ministry. Uh, I believe that as, as, as we see week in and week out, uh, that we can reach more people through the bus ministry uh, as far as getting them to church, getting them to Jesus, than just about any other, uh, any other tool. Now, there's somebody thinking, well, what about sound vision or radio or internet? And the truth of the matter is, while you may be able to reach more people through television, radio, or internet, I have found that very few people uh, that are reached through television, internet, uh, or radio actually end up in a church. And so I'm talking about church, uh, uh, a, a tool used to get folks not only to Jesus, but then plugged into the church so that they can be discipled, the bus ministry. Now, here in Luke chapter number 10, I'm not going to have you stand because I, I want to read quite a, a length here and maybe make a few comments in between. And so let your eyes drop down to verse number 25. I want to give you the whole context here. And uh, probably, um, to be honest, the, the, the introduction will be longer than the three simple points that I want to give you in relationship to the bus ministry. Verse 25 uh, gives us some background. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, talking about tempted Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Jesus said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, do this, and thou shalt live. But he, talking about the lawyer here, he willing to justify, him, uh, justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came by a certain priest that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he... Was at, when he was at that, uh, the place, looked on him and passed by on uh, the other side. But a certain Samaritan, uh, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him uh, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And he said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto, the, uh, unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, the lawyer said, He that showeth mercy on him. And, Jesus, uh, and then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou Likewise, I want to preach this thought tonight, being a neighbor through the bus ministry, being a neighbor through the bus ministry. Father, I pray you would help as I preach tonight uh, again about the bus ministry. I know probably folks are saying it just, I mean, every single week this month, uh, once or twice you've preached about the bus ministry, but I just don't think uh, I can preach enough about this ministry uh, that you have used throughout the days and the decades and are using here uh, to reach those uh, that nobody else wants, uh, to reach those who nobody else is trying to reach. And so help me, I pray, to uh, explain the importance, help me to explain the significance, help me, Father, uh, just to preach what you'd want me to preach in your power, and that it might be profitable to all of us here uh, that are not only in the bus ministry, but uh, support the bus ministry through our prayers, uh, through uh, giving, uh, through just being assistants, uh, as we've seen folks even today uh, prepare meals, etc. And so I pray, Lord, you'd help me, and we'll give you the honor and glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
Here in Luke chapter number 10, we have a lawyer come to Jesus. And he asked the Lord Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus points him to the law. Now you understand that you and I, uh, that the law, the Bible says, was a schoolmaster that ultimately brings us to grace or brings us to Jesus. That is, the law in and of itself, there is nothing wrong with it except our flesh cannot keep the law because you and I are sinners. The purpose of the law is that I might see myself and my sin as just that exceedingly sinful. And realizing that I am a sinner, grace comes and saves me uh, as I place my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus pointed this lawyer to the law, the idea was that it would reveal that I do not love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, uh, all that I am, and I do not love my neighbor as myself. Here, uh, this he said, how do you read the law? And he answers there that, uh, uh, that I'm to love the Lord uh, my God with all my strength, soul, mind, heart, body, etc., and my neighbor is myself. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Now, the idea behind that uh, should have been uh, if uh, you and I, if you and I were there or if uh, for, a, for a sinner, uh, they would have said, I don't do that, Lord. I not love you the way I ought to. And I certainly don't always love my neighbor as myself. That was the purpose in Jesus doing that, was to bring that, uh, that lawyer to a place of acknowledging his sin so that he could receive forgiveness. And when you and I, as we reach people, we need to do the same thing. Never gloss over the fact that someone is a sinner and get them to be saved, because if they're not a sinner, what are they being saved from? And so Jesus is pointing out to this lawyer, trying to, uh, that you're not uh, a sinner. He says, willing to justify himself, he said, but who is my neighbor? And so obviously this lawyer might, might, you know, if we can read into this a little bit, obviously the neighbor uh, probably hasn't treated uh, his neighbor uh, as he ought to. Who is my neighbor, Lord? I mean, is it the person next door? Uh, is it a person down the street? Well, who is my neighbor? He's saying that, being very technical, so that he might justify himself. Jesus then gives us what we have often termed as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus gives a story, a parable with, again, a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He is giving us some principles there about who my neighbor is. Now, you and I, as Christians tonight, uh, the law is not uh, bad, it's not evil. We still, uh, uh, if we go down the law, those are still morally acceptable in God's eye. I ought to love the Lord my God with all my heart, and with all my strength, with all my might, with all my... I still ought to do that, so ought you. And I still ought to love my neighbor as myself, okay? Now, I'm not loving them to get me saved. I'm saved by the good grace of God. I'm doing it because I'm saved, and because I'm saved, I want to be morally right with my master. So, I want to be a good neighbor, and you should want to be a good neighbor, uh, and so this has some importance and impact on us. Who is my neighbor? Because I want to be a good neighbor because the law is summed up in loving the Lord our God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, before I go a little bit further, may I say this? You will never love your neighbor the way you ought to until you love God the way you ought to. You will never love this way correctly in any relationship until you love this way correctly. But, if you love this way correctly, it prepares, it lays the foundation so that I can love this way correctly. It's important to love both this way and this way. I cannot be right this way and be wrong this way. I cannot be wrong this way and be right this way. Both of them are important. First, uh, love, my Lord, uh, love the Lord your God. Second, love my neighbor is myself. I submit to you today, and you and I wanting to do that, because as Christians we want to please our Lord, we want to do what's right, 
we need to understand who our neighbor is, number one, and how to be a good neighbor. And tonight I want to show you that the bus ministry, uh, if you would, we can be a good neighbor. In fact, we are good neighbors by running buses. We are the epitome of being a good neighbor to Cadillac in Lake City, to Manton, to McBain, uh, to the surrounding communities. We are good neighbors by running the bus ministry. He said, uh, y'all love your Lord, your God. Now, I believe a lot of us do that, but I think some of us fail with the neighbor thing. And one way our church is trying to be a good neighbor is by running that bus. Now, we'll often hear, I'll often hear folks say, well, now, uh, we don't know a whole lot uh, about your church, or you guys don't get involved with the rest of us. Uh, uh, I had a... Uh, uh, a candidate that I sat with here uh, a Tuesday ago, maybe two Tuesdays ago, and had lunch with, and he said, I just came from the Ministerial Association, and I thought I'd see you there. I said, I, no, you won't see me there. I've never been there. Don't know who's there. Uh, don't know a whole bunch about it. Uh, uh, you know, I just kind of keep my head down. And he said, well, I thought every preacher was part of the Ministerial Association. I said, I'm not part of the Ministerial Association. Um, and he said, well, uh, you know, uh, in sitting there, I can understand why. <laughs> And I laughed a little bit. I said, I don't need to know anymore. And, and we began to talk about a few things. And he said, well, you know, they do have some good things because they're doing this to be good neighbors. And they're raising, you know, right now they're gathering all kinds of coats because it's going to get cold so they can give out coats and be a good neighbor. And over here they're giving out all kinds of food because uh, they're trying to be a good neighbor. They're trying to, uh, you know, be a, a help in their community. And over here they're getting all kinds of baby formula because you can't get baby formula right now and unless you're an immigrant, uh, an illegal immigrant. Uh, they, they're getting all kinds of baby formula because they want to be a good neighbor. And it's important that you're a good neighbor. I began to think about that, and I said, you know, it is important, because he said, I'm to love the Lord my God, but, but I'm also to love my neighbor as well. And how does our church, as far as a neighbor, how are we, I, I want our church to be neighborly. I want our community to think, uh, when I have a need, I've got a friend, I've got a neighbor at Faith Baptist Church. Now, that doesn't mean we can always do what they request. But I want them to think of it as this is a friendly church. This is a church that is important to our neighborhood. We are neighborly. I believe the bus ministry is one of the greatest ways to be a good neighbor. Now notice with me, if you would. Let me, tell the, let me, let me give you a little bit. We've read it. Let me just kind of give it to you quick. He asked the question, who's my neighbor? Jesus said there's a certain man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. Now, I've, I've preached this to you before. I don't have to rehash all of this. You guys understand. I believe that he said a certain man, not because Jesus didn't know who the man was. I, I, I believe he said a certain man, not because he made him up. I don't think Jesus had to make up stories to prove his point. He was God. He was omniscient. He knew all things. I believe there literally was at some place and some time a certain man that was in Jerusalem, went down to Jericho, who fell among thieves that stripped him of his raiment and left him half dead. He used a, the term a certain man, I believe, because that man was a type of every man. It was a type of you, it was a type of me, it was a type of everyone who uh, has walked this earth. That is, uh, he is someone that went from Jerusalem uh, to, to Jericho and he met, fell among thieves. Again, the Bible describes uh, uh, the devil as a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And when he gets what he wants from us, ultimately he leaves us on the road half dead. That is, you and I are dead in trespasses and sin. While we're physically alive, we're spiritually dead uh, upon arrival. We're DOA, dead on arrival. As soon as we're born, we're dead in trespasses and sins. And he leaves us there. So this certain man could be you. This certain man could be me. This certain man was me. This certain man was you. This certain man is anyone. The thief, uh, obviously, is the devil. Uh, uh, he's left on the side of the road. And we see a priest come by, which is, uh, uh, if you would, uh, signifies or typical or symbolic of religion. Uh, that is uh, the priest, the head uh, of, 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 if you would, of Judaism. Uh, and uh, he comes by, to, or he passes by, he sees him, and he passes by on the other side. Because, friends, understand uh, that while uh, there is a such thing as true religion, religion itself does not save, 
a relationship with Jesus Christ saves, and once I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then I practice true religion. Religion does not save, Christ saves, but then I have true religion or practice true religion after I'm saved. So the idea that said, well, I don't believe in religion, then you don't believe the Bible, okay? I, I'm so, I, I'm, I'm to hear, I'm to hear with means for theology. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just into a relationship. I'm not into, uh, uh, I'm not into religion. Then you're not into the Bible. Just, just go ahead, listen. Tuck in your ignorance, it's showing. Because the Bible says true religion, right? So there's good religion. It's like folks who say, well, I'm not into tradition. Paul, on no fewer than three occasions in the same book, mentions to follow the traditions that have been handed down. So some tradition is bad, but some tradition is good. We need to be careful. We need to study again. We need to, so here we go. We see here that the priest is a picture of religion. Religion can't save. You can go to church and be lost as a billy goat in a ball game. You can, you can get baptized, die, and go to hell. You can, count cand uh, you can count beads, light candles. You can go through a catechism. Uh, you can be a member of this church, die and go to hell. Because religion does not save you, trusting Christ is your Savior saves you. Okay, he's a picture of religion. Now, then a Levite comes by. This is a picture, if you would, of a, of a Christian, if you would, just a uh, 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 somebody who's, who's right with God uh, or, or, or saved, but he's complacent. He's unconcerned. He comes to where he's at, too. He looks at him, and he passes by on the other side. And so, listen, religion won't get, religion won't get to that lost man, that certain man that all of us were. The average apathetic Christian won't get to that man, which all of us were at some point. Then... A Samaritan, which is traveling, comes to where he's at, sees him, has compassion on him, uh, sets out to be a help to him, ultimately does that. Jesus then says, out of these three, the professional clergy, the apathetic Christian, or just this common fellow right here, who was the neighbor? Now, I'll tell you, our answer today, while we wouldn't say it, while, while we, we do say it without meaning to say it, our answer today many times is the professional clergyman. He's, he, he's the neighbor. I mean, he has a stately service, or he has a jamming for Jesus service, and we're all there, and man, we're just so touched. But listen, if we, we're not talking about being touched in a service. We're talking about someone dead on the side of the road. We're, we're not talking about what takes place in here. We're talking about what takes place out there. That's the neighbor. And so it's not... Oh, I, I mean, I just, get, I just get chill bumps. I get chill bumps when he speaks. I just get chill bumps. And oh, I mean, when that guitar, I mean, it comes in heavy. I mean, the hair on the back of my neck, it just, I, oh, I, it's just, it's just such a great place. I mean, I just love it so much. Not professional religionist. Religion doesn't save. It's not the apathetic Christian. Who's that? You know, that, that, that's the, the, the fella, the gal, the person comes to church, maybe faithful, takes up their, uh, their chair space, uh, they're in, they're out, they've checked off their religious routine, ritual, duty for the day, and, and they don't think about Christianity, they don't think about the Bible, they don't think about Christ, again, until next Sunday. They're, they're not going to reach the neighbor. It's this Samaritan, which is a picture of, 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 if you would, it, it was odd because, again, Samaritans and Jews don't have anything to do with one another. Samaritan was kind of a dog. They're kind of an outcast. They were kind of, this, this Samaritan in doing this would have been very, if I can use a Bible word from this morning, peculiar. Or, uh, above ordinary. It, this, is, this is a different thing that going on, which is very much, unfortunately, the case. The soul-winning Christian, 
the Christian that is concerned with their neighbor out there, not just their standing in here, that's an oddity. Statistics say, and I don't know how they always get all these statistics, and so maybe it's off a little bit, but statistics say that 5% of Christians, 5% of all Christians, win all the souls to Christ that are one. Only 5% of Christians will ever lead someone else to Christ. 95%, they may be nice people, they may be well-dressed people, they may give a bunch of money people, but they just never win anyone to Christ. Only 5% do. So they're, if I can, peculiar. They're different. In a good way, peculiar. Now, we got the story here. I want to show you one thing in the story connected to the bus ministry and give you three bullet points. First, notice with me if you would, in chapter number 10, in verse number 34. We'll start verse number 33. This certain Samaritan, he journeys, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him. Now notice that phrase there. We'll see it in just a minute. He went to him. He didn't say, you need to come to me. He went to him. We'll see it in just a minute. He went to him. Uh, yeah, uh, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Notice that last phrase. He set him on his beast. Now, if I had a cop ministry last week, I'm going to have a beast ministry this week, which is a forerunner of the bus ministry. He sees him. He's wounded. He's half dead. He helps him initially. He sets him on his beast, which is a forerunner of the bus ministry. I know that ticks some people off. He takes him to the inn where he helps him some more and then hands him off to someone that can extend care and says, I'll be back to check on him. And what we see here in those two verses is exactly what we need to be doing in this place. It is fulfilling the Great Commission. Now notice with me, if you would, how to be a neighbor through the bus ministry. Number one, notice here. If I'm going to be a good bus worker and be a neighbor, I need to be a soul winner first. I need to be a soul winner first. The first thing I see about this bus ministry, beast ministry here, bus ministry where we're at today, uh, that makes us neighborly and shows that we love our neighbor is that we are soul winners. Verse 34, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Notice with me, if you would, in the Great Commission, we're told to go and teach all nations. In Mark, we're told to go and preach the gospel to every creature. In Acts uh, chapter number uh, 1, uh, uh, we're told ultimately uh, uh, to uh, preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the world. Over and over and over and over again, uh, uh, we are told to go to where the sinner's at uh, and give the gospel to them uh, that are on the road of life uh, in a ditch someplace, half dead, uh, they're not told to come to church and get right. We're told as a church, if we're right, we'll go to them and give them the gospel. And so to be an efficient, to be a good bus worker, and to be a good neighbor, you and I need to be soul winners. A good neighbor doesn't say, if you can make it here, I can help you. A good neighbor says, I'll go find you because I know you need help uh, and I'll help you if you let me. Now, some folks won't let us. Some folks, we'll knock on the door and all we want to be is a help. And we'll knock on the door and they'll get mad. They'll slam the door in our face. Uh, they may uh, give us a few choice words. I've been called some things other than pastor and preacher before at some doors. Uh, I've been called some things that I haven't been called in a long time before. Now, I'm just there to help. I really want to help them, and I can help them because I know their problem. It's a sin problem. I know their need. They need Jesus Christ. I have the, uh, I have the, the answer in that I have the gospel, either in a gospel track or my soul winner's testament. I have it here. I want to be a help. I'm not going to charge anything. It's going to be painless. This, you're going to be better on the other end. But they don't, sometimes they won't let us. The bus ministry, if you're going to be a good bus worker 
or if you're going to be a good neighbor, the both of you, you got to be a soul winner. Now, in our bus ministry, and our bus workers know this, I'm not telling them something they don't know, I'm telling you folks that maybe don't understand the bus ministry. In the bus ministry, the primary purpose is not to fill 72 seats or 72 spots in a full passenger bus. That's not the primary purpose. Now, I prefer to have them filled if I'm getting, if I've, it's the same amount of gas whether we have one or 72. So I'd rather, I mean, just being efficient and just kind of being that guy, I'd rather have 72. But that's not the purpose. You say, what's the purpose behind the bus ministry to reach a soul? When we go out, we go out not to find number 74, number 6, number 37. We go out to give the gospel so that someone might be saved, whether they ever ride the bus or not. He started not by saying, get on my beast and come to the inn. He went to where he was at. He went, he go, go in the gospel. He went to where he was at, and then we see he sees him half dead. He has compassion, and he pours in oil and wine. Now, we have some more symbolism. Here's a man that's half dead. In those days, uh, oil, uh, and still does today, uh, not like essential oils, uh, although that's the first mention of essential oils in the Bible, one of them, uh, and not like essential oils, it has medicinal properties, and, and, and wine as well. And so the idea here is he's, he's physically, uh, he went to where he's at, and he's physically, happened. there's a spiritual application though as well. When we go out, we're not necessarily going out to get him on a bus. What we're doing, we're going out to pour in oil, picture of the Holy Spirit, and wine. Now watch, nobody is saved if the Holy Spirit isn't involved. Nobody's saved. All kinds of things may happen. But nobody gets saved outside the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to convict. The Holy Spirit needs to draw. And ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that converts or regenerates. Nobody's saved outside the Holy Spirit. It, re it, it requires the Scriptures. It requires the Holy Spirit. And it, it requires a person for, that, uh, for someone to be saved. It requires those three people. They have to be involved. So we see the picture right here. He pours in oil. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and then wine. What's wine? Wine is a picture in the Bible of joy. Of joy. Now notice the order. It is I get saved and then I have joy. We have a world that is running around trying to get joy. And then if I get happy enough, if I get things right, if I get things fixed, then I'll get to church and get plugged in. You've got it backwards. They're killing themselves to be happy, and happiness is found ultimately uh, in Jesus. Oil first, then wine. But now, here's what we've seen in our bus ministry. I just heard, I can't remember who was telling me the story uh, just the other day. Uh, they said uh, we had a parent that was, uh, they were out visiting, and, and the parent, I believe it was a mother, said, uh, you know what, uh, I, I, I was just really frustrated for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I, I, just, I, I was just frustrated. He said, my kid went, drove, I got on your, he said, what was wrong? He said, my kid got on your bus, went to your church, said something about saved and Jesus and something, and now all she does is sing them songs around here. She just sings songs. And at first, you know, when I, Jesus this or, or Jesus, it didn't bother me too much, but that's all she does. I mean, she's doing this, she's singing about Jesus. She's doing this, she's singing about Jesus. She's doing this, she's singing about Jesus. And I started to get frustrated for a minute. I, I started to get angry. I, you know, I'm not religious. I don't care if she goes. But she, all she does is talk about Jesus now. And I was going to ask her to stop. But then it dawned on me, I've never seen her this happy. I've never seen her this happy. See, when you and I get the oil, we'll get the wine. That is, if you and I get saved, that joy will come. So we see here the soul winner uh, is a bus worker uh, and as a good neighbor, and both are, the uh, are, are, are one and the same, both are one and the same in this regard. Uh, as a soul winner, I can't give them joy. I can't fix most of their problems. 
They'll say, preacher, uh, you're here. I'm glad you're here. I've got a problem for you. Most cases, I can't help them, but I know someone who can. I know someone who can. And so we get them as a good bus worker and as a good neighbor. We need to be soul winners, soul winners first. It's not just about putting number 73 in the bus. It's about getting a soul to Jesus and then putting that soul in a bus. And we'll see that in just a minute. So number one, we see how are we good neighbors. Preacher, you don't have a food bank. You're not a good neighbor. Preacher, you're not giving out free stuff. You're not a good neighbor. Preacher, you know, you don't support uh, uh, the chambers uh, of commerce, whatever. Preacher, you don't advertise in the tourist uh, bureau. You know, preacher, you guys, uh, you know, if you want to be neighborly, you got to get involved. No, 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 we're neighborly. Well, how are you neighborly, preacher? Uh, we go out and we find those that are half dead on the side of the road, and we give them the gospel, uh, and when they get saved, Jesus begins a work that produces something in them that no coat, no job, no education, uh, uh, no, no, nothing else will give them the joy that they'll have in Jesus. Jesus. And so the bus ministry is being a good neighbor in that the bus ministry is not just about running buses around, spending gas money and having, we have fun. They do crazy stuff. They eat eight pieces of watermelon. God help. At least we didn't have to feed her this afternoon. We're going to have that. We, we want to do that stuff. That's not the primary purpose. What's the primary purpose? There is someone over there. There's a little boy. There's a little girl. There's a mama. There's a daddy. And by the way, lest you think uh, that the bus ministry is just, well, you know, it's like Sunday school. It's just for the kids. Uh, we have had a number. Uh, we, have, we have adults on both buses. And we do just about every week. We'll have one at least on, uh, uh, on one bus. We have a fella uh, that uh, has come the last couple of weeks uh, that I promise uh, there, uh, he, may be a little bit, uh, he may be a little bit hard to look at. There's probably, and I, I, I know that he, he didn't think that we'd even let him in a church because he's had some situations like that. That's exactly who we're looking for. He got off the bus today. He gave me a, he gave me a shoulder hug. We shook hands. He gave me a shoulder hug. And uh, I, I saw him at handshake time. I said, now, are you keeping these folks in order? And, and, and again, because, because of his physical um, limitations, he can't articulate his words real well. He sounds a little bit better than me, but not much. You know, he, uh, he just, oh, her, 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 her. Little tears in his eyes. Because somebody found, had compassion on him who was on the side of the road, half dead, and religion passed him by, and apathetic Christians passed him by, all but the soul winner, the bus worker, the good neighbor, went to where he was when nobody else wanted him. Went to where he was and, and, and gave a little bit of, 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 of oil that produced a whole bunch of wine in his life. Thank God for bus workers. Thank God for soul winners. It wasn't, in, in, many, in, in many, you understand this, he would not be a prize for most churches. But he is here. Now I understand. Hit, listen. We've got little girls and little boys. We've got mamas and daddies. We've got folks that are strung out on this. we got folks that just got out of there. Thank God for them. He said... Well, the law, for, the law says, I love God, but I love my neighbor. How does our church love our neighbor? We find those that are half dead on the side of the road, unwanted, unloved by the devil in the world. And we give them the gospel, and Jesus changes their life. Number two, not only does a bus ministry involve you and I being sacrificially it also involves us being 
if I alliterate it this way, a schoolmaster. A schoolmaster is just simply a teacher, um, but I was using an S to alliterate, so a schoolmaster. Notice with me, if you would, in verse number 34. He went to him, he bound up his wing, uh, wounds, pouring in oil and wine. What's that? That's a soul winner. He went to where he was at. He's at his house. He's at his place of business. He's at the soul winners at the park. Uh, the soul winners uh, uh, at, at the grocery store. The soul winners where he's at. But then, notice what he does. He takes them from where he's at. He sets them on the beast. And he takes him to the inn. Now, the Bible says there, he sets him on his own, uh, he pours, uh, pouring in oil and wine, sets him on his own beast, and he brings him to the inn and took care of him. Now, here's what's happening. He sets him on the beast. As he, is, as he is taking him to the inn, no doubt he's caring for him along the way, as he has started to right here. Now he's bringing him to the inn where he can care for him some more. In the bus ministry, this is why I say it's the greatest tool for evangelism and for completing the Great Commission. The bus ministry, if you take a ride on our bus, you're going to do that. You're going to hear this. No doubt, uh, I was, I was, I, you're, you're going to have fun. You're going to play some games. You're probably going to be grossed out at some point on the bus in one way, shape, or form. You're going to sing some bus songs, but you're also going to recite some verses, you're also going to hear a gospel message, you're also going to be taught to memorize and learn the scripture here. So, here, he pours in oil and wine, he, if you would, he, um, he heals him, but he's not at perfect health. When we get him saved, that's just the beginning. See, don't ever... We need to be careful that we don't go, okay, I led him to the Lord and then left him. We can't do that. That's not the Great Commission. We lead him to the Lord, but we've got to get him to the inn. Where's the inn? The inn's the church. i got to lead him to the Lord, but i got to get him to the church. Now, some of these folks can't get to the church. Some of these folks don't have cars. Some of the folks like me have cars, but I can't afford gas. I mean, uh, we got to get him to the church somehow. And so he said, well, I can't, listen, he's too weak. He's just been half dead. He's too weak for me to have, go ahead and walk. He's too weak for me to say, hey, can you make it to the inn? And listen, they just got saved. They're too weak to wait a week and expect them to show up in church. They ain't going to wait. They're, they're, listen, they're going to forget about it. They're not going to do it. They're too weak. They're newborns. And so uh, we, we, we get him on a bus, and then we take him to the inn. All the while, what is he doing? He's taking care of him. What are we talking about here? We're talking about discipleship. We're talking about he's saved, okay? He's, he, we, he poured in wine, wine uh, oil and wine. He healed him, but he's not perfectly whole. And when we're saved, uh, we're a new creature in Christ, but we're babes in Christ, and we need to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's not going to happen uh, uh, with that person at the same friends in the same places. So we got to put them in a beast uh, of a bus uh, uh, and ultimately get them here, all the while taking care of him. How? We're teaching them to grow. You don't think uh, that the bus song, I know, I know, I know. Wow, those just silly bus songs. It's interesting. Uh, you get on a bus one time, I guarantee you three bus songs will get stuck in your head. All week long, you'll be singing uh, some bus songs. Now, we do have a few bus songs, a few bus songs that, uh, well, they're just for fun, all right? They're of a no spiritual value at all. Brown socks. <laughs> no spiritual, but listen, they're fun. They're fun. And don't make me sing brown socks. We got a couple of them, no spiritual value. But you know what most of them? Most of them are taken right out of scriptures. Most of them, most of them have a Bible truth in it. And here's what happens. They're stuck in my head. And so all week long I'm singing this Bible song. And before long, this song and this principle is not only stuck in my head, it gets stuck in some of their hearts. They're beginning to grow. But not, not just the songs. I mean, it's not just the songs because, again, um, 
I think it was Miss Emily, uh, on the first day, uh, they have a number of, 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 of uh, verses that they were to memorize. I think uh, the first week on their bus, there was 104, if I remember right, I may, it may be 106, please forgive me, 104, 106 or so, verses that were recited by kids. Now listen, I, I promise you, we don't have, let's, if we exclude the kids here, the rest of us in here, 104 verses right now, anyone want to challenge me? I mean, take the kids out of it. The kids don't get to be in it. You and me, right? We're, gonna give, we're, we're just going to rattle off 104. We can all be on the same team and not going to get 104. Right? But those kids learned 104 verses and said them in one week. In one week. What am I saying? I'm saying that not only do we go and win them, then we begin to teach them, to grow them. They're learning principles. He took care of them. That is, he acted as a teacher, a discipler. The fact of the matter is, there are many bus kids that I, I try to greet them at the door and, and high-five them and give them hugs and different things like that. But the fact of the matter is, many of those bus kids will rarely get much of my time. They'll get a whole lot of you bus workers' time, though. So the idea, well, I just am going to, I'm going to win them, I'm going to get them on a bus, and, and then preacher's going to take care of them. That's just not how it works. We get them to the end, uh, but we're still responsible. You go ahead. Uh, there are a few things uh, uh, that, uh, that are very dangerous that you better be careful about. Uh, you be very dangerous about uh, mother she bears, she bears around cubs. You got to be careful with she bears. Mamas and their babies. you got to be real careful around mamas and babies. They'll just tear you off. And bus workers and their kids. You better be real careful. They'll go ahead and tear your head off for one of their bus kids. They'll fight you over a bus kid. My bus kids don't do anything wrong. Have you seen your bus kids? Now, they're going to, if we're doing it right, we're going to be a teacher, a discipler, educator, a schoolmaster as they're coming in. I feel responsible. He didn't just say, hey, you know what? I did my duty. I'm out. No, he's completing the Great Commission. Now, he gets them to the end. He gets them to the end, and he talks to the innkeeper. And he tells the innkeeper, I'm taking care of them, but I need to go. You need to take care of them as well. What's that? Now, watch. Here's where some of us get involved. You say, preacher, I'm just not going to get on a bus. It's not my personality. They scream, they yell, they holler. I... But in the end, there's innkeepers. They're Sunday school teachers. They're junior church workers. They're, they're primary church workers. They're support staff so that they can do. They're helpers to helpers so that the other folks can do that. That what happens? That they're continued to be taken care of. So they're schoolmasters, if you would. They're teachers. And it's, it's more than just simply a schoolmaster. I use that term to alliterate, but the fact is it's more than that. It's you and I discipling and you and I investing in and you and I uh, being um, personally involved and, and, and responsible for the growth of these folks who have been entrusted with us. God's entrusted us with that. I promise you. I promise you. I, and and I, I talk to every week of the world, I talk to folks. I promise you, when I say 75, they say, you bring how many in? I challenge you to find 75 kids that are brought in to a church in this community right now. Now, God has entrusted us with them. So we are responsible not only that they get the gospel, but that they grow. We can't just say, well, we gave them the gospel and that's good enough, they're saved. No, that's the problem with most Christians. Uh, they got saved, they never grown, and they're now perpetual babies. 
And so I scream and shower and hout. Uh, I, I scream and shower and hout. That is awesome. I couldn't do that again if I tried. <clears throat> I scream and holler and shout, grow up, stop being selfish, serve somebody else, sacrifice. But they can't because they never grew up. They just got old. And so we can't do that. We, we're responsible. We need to teach them. We need to grow. And who knows? Again, some of them really get it. Some of them get a little bit, some of them get a little bit more, and every once in a while, every once in a while, one of them, it just absolutely clicks, uh, and they eat it up, and they grow, and they go off to Bible college, and God calls them to do a work, uh, or they marry a preacher, they go to a mission field, uh, whatever it might be, and you go, I have a little part in, in helping that kid to grow in to the man or the woman, the missionary, the evangelist that he is. To, I can't believe God would let me do that. But we've got to do it right. We've got to be a soul winner. But then, while they're made whole, or while they're helped, they're not completely whole. That is, they have to grow. So we're a schoolmaster. He was healed, but he was not back to perfect health. Let me give you one more thing tonight. We're done. I want to show you here the sacrifice. This is the problem, or this is the reason, or this is the excuse of why we don't run bus ministries, why we don't do it right, why um, we're not doing it the way we ought to do it. It's this word right here, sacrifice. Notice here the sacrifice involved in the Samaritan. He goes to where he was at. He was journeying, the Bible says. He had some place he was going. He wasn't walking aimlessly around looking for somebody who happened to be half dead. He was going somewhere. He was journeying. He sacrificed whatever his schedule was going to be to get involved in this situation right here. Not only did he sacrifice that, he became involved in a personal way. He not only looked and said, hey, hey yeah, be warmed and filled. I'll call 911 real quick and wait till the cops get here, the ambulance get here, and they can take it from here. He personally got involved in this situation. Now, I'm going to tell you something that you know already. I'm going to say it anyways. People are messy. It is a sacrifice to get involved with people because people are a mess. People have problems. And you know what? When you get involved, you're like, oh, I didn't need any more problems. Now I'm involved. And, 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 and oh, I just wish I wouldn't answer the phone. <laughs> he was willing to sacrifice whatever so he could be involved knowing no doubt the, the, the preacher that walked by, he probably said, listen, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm not getting involved in this. Get my hands dirty. I, I'm not, I ain't got time. The apathetic Christian, hey, listen, I'll call, I'll call an ambulance, but I'm not getting involved. People are messy. They break your heart. They stab your back. All kind, I, I don't want to deal with this. He sacrificed in that he involved himself. But notice not only his involvement, notice his investment. It was a sacrifice. It was his time. I promise by the time he poured in oil and wine, put him on a beast, got him to an inn, it's not like they lived in a big city. He was somewhere between Jerusalem and Jericho. Now, I don't know how many best westerns are between Jerusalem and Jericho in the New Testament, but I promise not many. So he no doubt traveled for a while, and then the idea behind it is he took care of him, and before he left, he paid the guy. Listen, he was there, he took the rest of his day. His calendar got cleared. He invested his time. It's sacrifice of time. Anyone in the bus ministry that's going to stay in the bus ministry has got to understand it's going to be an investment of your time. Your calendar is going to be wrecked. Secondly, he invested his beast. 
He could have said, hey, listen, I'll walk you to the end. I don't know if the beast was carrying the man. I don't know if the beast was carrying his supplies. I don't know if the beast was just walking. I, I don't know, but I know this, that it was an investment that he used his beast to put the wounded man on to get him. It was investment. It was a sacrifice. He didn't have to use it. It was his beast. But he chose to do that. Notice here he sacrificed his money. The Bible says that he paid the fare for the inn, but not only that, he gave the innkeeper money and said, if there's anything else, I'll take... Listen, you're not in the bus ministry 15 seconds before you realize those kids cost money. Candy alone, I would hate to see how much money people spend just on candy. But there's candies, there's prizes, there's games. You know what? There's just every once in a while God's put one of these kids on my heart and here's a pizza. Uh, every once in a while it's, hey, I'm just going to buy a bag of burgers and everyone that answers the door today is getting a burger uh, as far as my bus kids. There's all types of sacrifice. That's not to mention when the kid comes and you said, hey, go back and get your shoes and a little tear comes in their eye and they say, I don't have any shoes and you get them a pair of shoes or you get them a shirt uh, or you get them a little dress uh, or, 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 or you just take care of a need that you think a mother or a father would take care of, but mom and fa uh, mother and father are so messed up that they're and so consumed with their self and so wrecked by sin that they can't see past their addiction or their problem of this little kid here that's suffering. And somebody's got to do it, and so it's going to cost you some money. Finance. Dr. Malone always would say you can't build a church nor a bus ministry on spare time and pocket change. It's going to cost us something. And trust me, it costs us as a church something. It costs our bus workers personally something as well. There's a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice. But you know, in thinking about it, that's exactly how God would have it. Because God himself, in trying to reach those who did not want him was willing to sacrifice his son, his best, his all, to reach me and you. And we are no more like God than when we're sacrificing to reach someone else who can in no way, shape, or form at the moment repay us in any way. We're not looking for him to. See, when folks say, when this lawyer said, who is my neighbor? You know who our neighbor is? Every creature. Every creature. Well, how do you reach your neighborhood? And how are you a good neighbor in your neighborhood? We're going out week to week, day by day, two by two, one by one. We're going out and we're finding those half dead. And we're getting the gospel and putting them on a beast and bringing them to the inn, all the while taking care of them and then saying to the innkeeper, the junior church worker, the Sunday school teacher, the preacher, the other, hear so-and-so. Take care of them as best you can because I've got to go. But I'm going to be back. That's the Great Commission. And that's why the bus ministry is one of the greatest evangelistic tools in reaching our generation. It completes the Great Commission like no other ministry. Like no other ministry. It doesn't compete with Sunday school. It completes Sunday school. It doesn't compete with junior church. It completes junior church. Junior church doesn't compete with it. It doesn't compete with something else. It completes it. I want to be a good neighbor. I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. And if I do, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. There's no greater way to love my neighbor than get him the gospel, get him saved, get him on a bus, get him in my car, get him in his own car, get him to the church where he can grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, turn around, get out, and do the same thing that we did to him. That's what the church exists for. Everything else is fluff. 
Now, I'm not, my, I'm not against having, we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs and bounce house. I'm for that. But the purpose of the church, the true purpose of the church, is the Great Commission. Everything else are just responsibilities. Father, I pray that we would once again understand the importance of the bus ministry to our church ministries. That maybe we would find ways in our life to ask you, Lord, if maybe I ought to be a part of the bus ministry in some way. Or how can what I do help assist the church in the bus ministry? We thank you, Lord, for those that have sacrificed and are willing to invest time and treasure and uh, calendar and, 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 and really personal attachment at times as it hurts when bus kids leave and move and aren't allowed to come anymore. But we thank you, Lord, that we still have folks that do it. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we have soul winners that are uh, trying to reach people. They're trying to get the gospel out and trying to get them to the church where they can grow. Help us to ever be an evangelistically minded church. One that we're not saying, hey, you ought to come here, but one that we're out going to them, to the highways and hedges, and compelling them to come to Christ 